The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, o Lord. After John had been arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. As he passed by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting their nets into the sea. They were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Come after me, and I will make you fishers of men. Then they abandoned their nets and followed him. He walked along a little farther and saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They too were in a boat, mending their nets. Then he called them. So they left their father Zebedee in the boat, along with the hired men, and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Each week as we share the Word of God, the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts. We have that sense that we want more, we hunger, and we thirst for God's Word. And of course, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. What we discovered today in the readings is uh, a long time ago in uh, Assyria, uh, the pagans uh, at Nineveh, um, they had a king, the people, the city was very large. Uh, they were wicked, and they were uh, very torturous, and God wanted to spare that city. So God wanted to uh, let the folks know of his goodness. So he chose Jonah, and Jonah was very reluctant. Matter of fact, he fell overboard and was swallowed up in a big fish. We call it a whale and then spewn up on the shore after three days. It's kind of a Christ figure in many ways. And what we begin to recognize is he did not want this task because he thought no one would listen. No one would uh, pay attention. After all, these are the heathens. These are the unclean. These are the infidels. And before he even got uh, half a day's journey, the king and all the citizens uh, put sackcloth and ashes on, and they repented, and they were saved. I think that that gospel uh, it, that we read and Deacon Bob did so beautifully uh, gives us also that sense of mission, that sense of call. Jesus chose the apostles, Peter, James, and John, Andrew. They were fishermen, and he asked them to be fishers of men. Uh, he asked them to uh, embark on a new journey. They were to leave uh, father, leave family, uh, leave their boats and go out and share the message. We call that today sharing the gospel, but evangelization. And it's a very important component. We heard similar themes. Remember the prophet Elijah? Uh, he went to the prophet Elisha, and he was farming with his family. Many of our parishioners are farmers close to the fields. Uh, and he says, come, I want you to be a prophet. And he did. He left all. And remember then, Elijah uh, went off in the fiery chariot, uh, and he was to come at the eschatological age. He'd come at the, the beginning of the new eon. Well, many folks thought that John the Baptist, whom we heard in today's gospel, was Elijah, uh, because he baptized for the forgiveness of sins in the Jordan River. As we begin to reflect upon all of this, we see the call and leaving all. You know, last evening I was at Damascus uh, Catholic Youth Winter Camp uh, with uh, several people. That was the junior high folks, but also uh, the lay missionaries. There's 15 there all year long. They just went out to Kansas and Ann Arbor. Uh, they share the faith. They're giving uh, these years of their life, uh, most of them college students or just uh, beyond, uh, to share the gospel. And they listen to that second reading that was proclaimed so beautiful by Dr. Cheryl. You know, they're living pure lives, chaste lives, holy lives. Uh, they are being witnesses. They're not going with the culture. 
they're going counterculture. And I think that, uh, remember Archbishop who became Cardinal John O'Connor of New York, says sometimes we have to be countercultural. I remember Cardinal uh, Joseph Bernadine, uh, formerly of Cincinnati, but then of Chicago. And he says, we need to transform the culture. You know, H. Richard Niebuhr gave us different models. Sometimes Christ is lifting up culture. Sometimes uh, you're going against culture. Sometimes you're transforming culture. Sometimes we're going alongside. Wherever we are, we are to be radically in love with Jesus, but to realize with the eighth beatitude, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, uh, we are now in union with folks in seven continents, uh, and we can track who is watching us and listening with us and praying with us. Uh, that's a new phase. But also, in a very real way, my heart has been with many of my students uh, as they make this pilgrimage to Washington, D.C. I've been in contact with people from uh, Lancaster, St. Mary's, where I was the priest, uh, in contact with some of the folks uh, over uh, from Newark, my home parish, St. Francis de Sales, Blessed Sacrament, uh, contact with some of the busloads of folks here in Muskingum County, uh, Father Jan Sullivan leading uh, a pilgrimage. So, so many folks that spreads out, even the parishes I was with in Columbus. And as I see the pictures and I see the videos, uh, I wonder sometimes why the news media doesn't broadcast this. Uh, you know, this is the largest civil rights march continuous in the history of the United States. Why the silence? We ask ourselves these questions because sometimes uh, we have to go counter the culture. Back in 1973, when I was at the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, uh, the Supreme Court came out with a couple of decisions, Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton. Basically, they took the same argument that they took back in 1857 with the Dred Scott decision. Basically, uh, an African American, back then they would say a black man, uh, was not a person. They were property. And the master could do with them whatever they wanted to do. They had no rights. They could not vote. Uh, they could not uh, do what they wanted. They had to do what the master wanted. And so, in 1896, with Plessy versus Ferguson, the Supreme Court case, they came along with separate but equal, and then they realized separate is not equal, so when I was one year old, in 1954, in Brown versus the Board of Education, the Supreme Court said everyone goes to school together. We see that just as normal, as healthy. Uh, everyone uh, certainly has uh, an equal opportunity. Uh, liberty and justice for all. Uh, the Constitution, endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, and among them are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Well, that's why so many folks uh, are marching in Washington, D.C., because we believe that life is sacred from the womb to the tomb. We believe that uh, this is a, a fundamental right uh, that folks have to uh, certainly live. You know, there's a beautiful passage, and I used this uh, in one of our uh, hospitals at one time. Uh, it's the story of Mary and Elizabeth. Mary newly conceived uh, with Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, and Mary, about five or six months along, when the baby uh, is in the womb and the baby uh, leaps is the word that they use, but the ancient language, it's really dances in the womb. And I used this, and this particular hospital had been performing some abortions. Uh, not a lot, but some. And all of the administration, uh, it's on an Ash Wednesday, we had an ecumenical service. Uh, they no longer performed those, what they called procedures. Because that is interesting. Jesus, this big, newly conceived. John the Baptist recognized him in his mother's womb, and John was literally dancing uh, because he saw the Son of God. 
This John the Baptist was to give his head. King Herod, you know the story, Herodias, Salome, uh, for uh, Jesus. He was preparing for the kingdom. And so as we come to Mass uh, today, it's kind of interesting because they talk about being fishers of men. The prophet Jeremiah had a very beautiful vision about the time when there would be fishers of men. When I was uh, a young adolescent, Monsignor Herman Mattingly, who's buried right outside of this church, uh, was my pastor, and I was one of 60 altar servers, and there were 60 young men in the choir. It was beautiful uh, at Newark St. Francis de Sales, my home parish. And one of the things that he liked to do was to fish, and he would take several of us uh, fishing, and he took us out of school, uh, and we went down here to Dillon one day, and uh, I've told you the stories, but he was not so much interested in the big muskies that we were going to catch, but that I would one day be a fisher of men, uh, be a disciple, called to uh, be an apostle. And each one of us that are here are called the same way. I always like the story, and I leave you with this. Uh, one of the great Monsignors, Monsignor Linus Drury, was down at St. Nicholas, and he was very special. His grandnephew is uh, Father Dan Drury, the pastor of St. Catherine uh, there in Bexley. And I just prayed with him uh, not too long ago. And one of the things that they said, that all during Mass, Father Linus uh, would tell fish stories. So I kind of snuck in one day, and I wasn't a priest. I was, uh, you know, just a regular person preparing. Uh, you know, I was in high school. I got my car. I thought I'd go in and just see what they were talking about. And basically, because of his advanced age, he had a little bit of the shakes. And so when he celebrated the Mass and he prayed the Eucharistic prayer, his hands shook a little bit. So he would be talking about the saints, Lawrence and Chrysogonus, Cosmos and Damien, Agatha and Perpetua. Well, the stories got bigger and bigger and smaller and smaller. <laughs> so they said he was telling fish stories. Uh, we're to tell fish stories, but the early Christians got it right. The name for fish in the ancient language is ichthus. And if you take each letter and spell it out in the ancient language and you add the word to it, it spells Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. And so there's a lot of persecution in the church. So what they would do when they kind of met each other, the early Christians, uh, they had this password, this secret code. They would kind of with their toe or their sandal or a stick, just call kind of a half of a smiley face. And then if there was another Christian involved or around, they would come along and draw kind of a smiley face upside down uh, that formed a fish. And that's how they knew that they were in love. But one of the early church fathers said it even better. Christians were easy to spot because everyone said, see how they love one another.